Welcome everybody to the Celebrity Hour podcast, the unbalanced note style, all about music. I'm Brian Kluger. We have an excellent show today. I have a legendary, a world heavyweight champion of music, composing instruments and film all the way from Los Angeles, Dan Romer. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. This is very exciting. This is, it's very exciting. The, the, the wrestling is coming out now, the, the, the live. <laughs> that was a powerful intro. I have not gotten such a mighty intro in my life. That was fantastic. It's part of the pro wrestling background, all that commentary. Gotcha. <laughs> so we're going to get into it. We're going to talk about the new film, Luca, uh, Disney Pixar, but we're also going to talk about a lot of the things you've done over the years, Superman and Lois, Far Cry 5, Atypical, Dear Evan Hansen, Wendy, Beast of the Southern Wild. But like in the movie, The Sound of Music, we've got to start at the very beginning. Dan, where did it all begin for you with music? Was it a certain song you heard on the radio? Were you in the car and your parents were like, listen to this, and it just hit you? What was it? Where did it all begin? Oh man. All right. I, if we're going all the way back, I mean, I started, I, I started playing piano when I was like five, I think, cause I saw my older brother playing piano and I thought it was really cool and I wanted to do it too. Um, he stopped playing piano pretty quickly. Um, and so did I, I stopped playing piano pretty quick too. I did not get good at piano, but then when I was seven, I, um, I, I, I think what happened was I saw an episode of The Wonder Years where Kevin Arnold got an electric guitar and I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. And it wasn't even so much that I was like, oh my God, I love music. I was just like, that's cool. The, the guitar is cool. And so I asked my parents if I could play guitar and they got me, um, you know, a, a very small, uh, like a you know, three quarter size, because um, I was seven, uh, nylon string guitar. And then I, 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 I like begged for an electric guitar, and, you know, because that's what I really wanted to play. And then I think I got one finally when I was like 10. I, I, they were like, if you can stick with guitar for three years or something, you, you show us that you're like, you can really stick with guitar and then we'll get you an electric guitar. And so I stuck with it. And then uh, along the way, I kind of fell in love with music. I think it was actually specifically uh, the Who's Tommy was the thing that was like, oh, okay. I, I actually am in love with music now. Um, I, I learned how to play every single song from the Who's Tommy on guitar and how to sing them all um that's impressive that's very impressive i gotta go back to the piano do you remember what type of piano you played and what was like the first song you learned on it was it Ooh, i want to say it was i want to say the brand is like acrosonic or something it's 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 my parents piano and it's still in their living room um and uh i love playing that piano i mean it's, it's in terrible terrible shape which I, I love which i love about it i love out of tune pianos you know um uh you know see see far cry uh you know <laughs> the, the, those pianos i i i like on far cry on uh um when the morning light shines in i uh i specifically had the piano tuner tune the piano out of tune for me i was like make this piano sound bad right that's um, very tom waitsy <laughs> yeah man you know what i'm talking about tom waits is well where are we gonna get started um, so, we should get started. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, should we go to Tom Waits now? We could go to Tom Waits if you want to. I'm always in. No, I mean, I love Tom Waits. I, you know, I, I, he became like one of my biggest influences in my life at age like 16 or something. I mean, Rain Dogs completely changed my life. And then, you know, heading over to Bone Machine after that, um, like, and I mean, his entire, I, I think, and I think his early stuff is great because he, he, he's an incredible songwriter. Right. You know, but his stuff from like Swordfish Trombones on is the stuff that like captivated my my heart. And, you know, whenever I'm doing, you know, percussion, uh, Tom Waits always sort of looms large over my head. You know, um, I had one of, I, 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 I was building a, um, well, I wasn't building, more, just, I, I, I had one of my assistants uh, make a um, sound bank for me of all of my, um, drums hitting hitting the, the rims of the drums with six so they sound kind of like prock, 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 kind of sounds um and uh i asked him to put um on the software sampler he made uh, the program he made to use those sounds i asked him to put a picture of tom waits on it awesome. so uh <laughs> yeah so i had a little like tom waits plug-in that, that my system made for me that i still use 
That's great. That's great. Oh, well, huge fans of Tom Waits. That's a instant bond right there. Uh, so you did you did put the piano out of tune and you uh, moved to guitar for a little bit because of Kevin Arnold, which I remember that episode vividly. You remember, right? I, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, that was a great episode. And they played like that uh, school party. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind yeah. Of, almost. I they remember did. very little about it. I have to be honest. I was I was seven, so or maybe six, but that's yeah. a good show. That was, a, that was a great show. And then now you, so was it in high school? Did you have any like bands in high school that you did, like that you were part of? Do you remember the names yeah. of those? Yeah, I was in a band called Moonrise in college. I was the singer and the writer. Um, and I was also in a band with some of my friends. Uh, we were called we were called Phantoms, this other band I was in. And we were, so Moonrise was more of like a big, um, like, uh, big rock band. We were kind of more like Smashing Pumpkins influenced, okay. that, that kind of stuff. And then I was in this other band, uh, Phantoms, and we were sort of more um, Magnetic Fields, Bill and Sebastian, uh, kind of like chilled out, more chilled out stuff. Um, and f- what happened with Phantoms is um, that I feel like half of that band worked on Beast of the Southern Wild. Um, this, the singer of the band was this guy, Josh Penn who is one of the producers on Beast of the Southern Wild. And then, uh, and then Ray Tintori, who was our percussionist did the special effects on, Beast of the Southern, on, on Beasts. Wow. Yeah. So everybody's musically inclined because I remember you and Ben kind of did some of the music or played instruments, I guess, together for that movie, right? Yeah, Ben and I co-scored that movie. I mean, I learned how to score films working with Ben. Like Ben and I kind of discovered how to score films together. We kind of like, Just, you know, neither of us went to school for film composing. Uh, We just were listening to lots of film scores together and tried to like kind of guess how films are supposed to be scored. What did you go to school for? Um, So I went to high school. uh, I went to LaGuardia in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, And I went, that is like the performing arts school. Um, uh, I I went to, I, I was a vocal major. So I was studying mostly opera. Um, and then for college, I went to SUNY Purchase and I studied um, studio production, which is essentially um, pop song, like pop music arranging and producing. Yeah. Um, and then I got my master's at SUNY. Uh, uh, although I, well, I, I got my master's in um, pop song writing, in pop composition. Um, but um, I did not, I didn't get my master's ultimately I, I, because I failed film scoring. Um, so I fell four credits short of my master, but, um, but I think they changed the amounts of credits that it's, that it, you need. So I might actually have it now. We'll, we'll, we'll find out. Well, we'll find out, but then, Hey, you've scored some of the best movies. It's like, in, it's incredible. And so when can you describe the day you met Ben and how that collaboration took a uh, hold? Yeah, I, uh, well, the day I met Ben was so. In college, I was producing this band called Skeleton Breath. Um, they were like sort of a prog band. It was like drums, bass, and violin, uh, like and the like electric violin kind of. Even if it wasn't electric, they still put like oh, we do a lot of distortion on it, you know. Um, but so I was friends with those guys, and those guys said to me, um, what, uh, they were like, "Hey, so we used to be in this other band back in high school." And this guy, Ben, was the lead singer and, and guitar player. And Ben is now a filmmaker. We were like 20 at this point, you know, 20 years old. And um, you're like, ben is, a, ben is this filmmaker now. And uh, he's in school at Wesleyan for film. And he's, score, he's doing this, this, this movie. And the bass player, Andrew Platt, from this band, he was, who was, you know, one of the writers of the band also, Andrew Platt was like, I'm going to score Ben Zeitlin's short film. It's called Egg. Um, so, he, you know, I was already producing that band. So they were like, so Andrew was like, can you engineer the film score that I'm writing? And I said, of course. And then Ben came out to record it. And that's where I met Ben the first time. And then Ben brought my old friend Ray with him, who was the percussionist from Phantoms, who I'd known since I was seven years old. Wow. And Ray was like, oh, yeah, Ben and I are like, you know, very, very close friends. We, I worked on Egg, he, he, I work on all of his movies, he works on all my movies, it was that kind of a thing. And so I met Ben that way. Uh, and, then, and then I guess a year or so later, Ray called me uh, and he was like, 
hey, I'm doing this short film uh, called Death of the Tin Man, and I'd like you to score it. And I said, I, I've never scored anything in my life. I don't, you know, I know how to write string quartets and stuff like that from school, from, from going to, to, from classical music school back in high school, you know, but it's like, I got very obsessed with classical harmony in, um, in, in high school. So I learned how to do all the like the string quartet four part voice writing stuff. And um, so I was like, I know how to do that kind of stuff, but like, I don't, uh, you know, I've never done it before. And he said, well, um, do you remember Ben Zeitlin, that guy you um, engineered his film score? And I said, yes. And he said, well, um, Ben doesn't actually know how to make music himself, but he knows how to direct film music. So maybe if I got the two of you together, like you could kind of be the musician and Ben could kind of be kind of guide you. So Ben and I spent like a week or so together scoring Ray Tentori's short Death of the Tin Man. And that was our first time really writing together. And then we loved working together. And then Ben asked me to do a short Glory at Sea. And then we did that. And then he asked me to do Beast of the Southern Wild. Wow. What an incredible story right there. Direct the music, you make the music. Like that's like, it's an incredible like duo right there that made some of the best and sweetest music of like the decade. <laughs> oh, thank you. I mean, yeah, Ben and I, I love working with Ben. You know, he's one of my best friends and, and, and you know, I, I, we, we love making music together. So with Beasts of the Southern Wild came out and the huge success that was after that, did just doors open up for you right after that? Um, well, I, so at that point, I had spent my entire 20s um, really um, working with rock bands and pop artists and that kind of, you know, folk artists, um, like indie, indie pop slash indie rock bands in, in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was, I was working with, um, with Ingrid Michaelson, with A Great Big World, uh, and uh, uh, Jukebox the Ghost. Um, and... That was kind of the focus of my, of my life. My, ba my band that I was in, I was in a band in college that broke up when we got LA, like a year or two out of college. And I just had focused my life solely on producing and mixing at that point. Um, and so um, when I got to, when I, when I scored Beast of the Southern Wild, I was like, okay, I, re I really loved doing this. And this, you know, when you're an artist, you kind of like, see what you're the different modes of what you're doing and how they how people react to them and you kind of make a decision about where you which direction you want your life to go in and i said you know i'd like to give a stab at going out to la and see if i can cut it as a film composer and you know it took a minute for it to work you know i came out to la and it was you know i, I had a few producers trust me uh very early on um you know but then really the thing i feel like the moment where it was like oh okay like i am i'm kind of i'm doing this kind of full time for real uh, was uh was with beasts of no nation carrie fukunaga's film yes once i did that film it was like because you know the thing is when you're a young composer when you're young anything i guess i don't know it's like you come into something and, and people say well you know we we love your music we love beasts of the Southern wild like you know, uh, and we have this film that we would love, we need a composer for, but we don't want a piece of the Southern Wild type score. And I'm like, well, I can do other stuff. You know, Beast of the Southern Wild was just what I did. Because, you know, Beast of the Southern Wild is a very specific sounding score. You know, yes. I recorded it all in a basement with one microphone. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, it's, and it's not, it's never more than one musician playing at the same time, except in one scene um wow because that that score is just so epic and grand like it, thank you yeah. yeah every violin except for like two fiddles in the movie is this one guy johnny dinklage every wow. violin and viola so he would just do you know 80 violin overdubs in one piece of music um so uh, an overdub is when you play uh, uh over i don't know how uh, uh, an overdub is when you play uh, um, an instrument and then play that instrument again on the same recording. So we did that 80 times in some recordings. He would play many different parts. I don't know if, you know, if, uh, if this is a, I, well, whatever. I, I don't want to be condescending to people and not knowing what overdubbing is. I, I, I don't know. Oh, no, no. I know what overdubbing is. So you can explain it to some of the listeners. They might not know. Great, great. 
Great. Yeah. I know you yeah, okay, awesome. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, and, and Johnny Dinklage is still my 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 violin player on 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 everything I do. You know, uh, he he's he plays every week on on Superman. Uh, he plays every week on Good Doctor. Um, and uh, you know, yeah, he's I, he just uh, played a ton on this upcoming uh, on this upcoming show, Station Eleven, that I just did that I'm extremely excited about. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. And I've just got to say, uh, with Beast of the Southern Wild, I'm one of the few that um, have the LP of Beast of the Southern Wild. Uh, that was just um, wow. you know, hard to find. It's hard to find, and you got one. I I did get one. It's very it's treasured, and I must say the like. There's something about your music because uh, I love the sound of uh, uh, strings being plucked. And then mm. maybe like a slow, gradual crescendo of horns or uh, strings coming into that. And then with Wendy and with Be Southern Wild, there is something there that I don't know what it is, but music makes me emotional sometimes. And every time I listen to certain tracks on both those, it it, it hits that chord. <laughs> That's great to hear, man. I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. And, there, and I think that element was brought to several tracks in Luca from Disney and Pixar, uh, specifically uh, Go Find Out For Me. That track is just incredible. So bringing everything you've done to Luca and then adding an Italian element, what was some of the research you did for Luca in your you know, studies for that? Uh, well, so... Enrico, the director, made me two gigantic, amazing playlists. One of them full of uh, rock music and pop music from like the 50s, 60s, 70s uh, in Italy. And then another playlist full of Italian film score. And so what I like to do when I'm going to be making music uh, that kind of uh, is, is in the, the idiom of another culture, uh, I like to just immerse myself in that music and listen to nothing but that kind of music for for as long as I can, because um, I feel like what I want what I, what I want in those instances is when I write melodies, I just want them to be influenced by Italian melodies. And when I write harmony, I want it to be influenced by Italian harmony. I don't want to be doing it super consciously. I want to be do, having it. I want it to like permeate my subconscious, so that uh, it comes off as less pastiche less like i'm trying to copy something and more just that that culture's music is a little bit more in, just woven into the dna of my writing at that moment because i think you get very influenced by whatever you're listening to at the moment right 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 i think part of that is when you take on something just like oh i did i get to rediscover this genre of music and then add your favorite elements into your own style and that's what you did with luke i like it i because there's certain like musicians i was like okay that's that person's song like I, I mean you could tell like okay, that's a Tom Waits song and like even from this career you've built so far I can instantly tell that's a Dan Romer song like I get <laughs> instantly giddy and excited when I hear it that's great to hear <laughs> so it's interesting that you have like this uh this this actual like arena of sound for you and I love it thank you yeah I uh you know I mean I think that some of the stuff that might be identifiable identifiable about my music is me trying to make things that um, I like, don't know, I never learned how to do, sort of. Or like, like I'm, the pizza, for example, the pizzicato stuff comes from, um, this is a different thing, I guess, but the pizzicato strings come from me being used to having um, palm muted acoustic guitar as a timbre. Mm -hmm. that I don't want to use in film scores generally because I feel like when I when I hear like rock guitar style playing on a score it kind of takes me out of like the idea of it being film music and I'm not look you can totally make a film score with like rock guitar playing I'm not saying you can't um but you know that I'm used to that tool that sound as something that I can use uh very effectively and pizzicato strings were the closest thing that Ben and I, when Ben and I started working together, that was when Ben and I started working together, that was the closest thing we had to palm muted acoustic guitar was pizzicato strings, was plucked strings. So that became a big part of me and Ben's style. Okay. 
All right. That, that's great. That's great to hear. And I get you with the electric guitar. I, well, that movie that comes to mind was the most or the recent Wonder Woman part one film when they added the electric guitar into the World War II uh, um, setting. And I was like, oh, hey, there's an electric guitar in World War II. It, you know, I, was, I would wonder if the, with the pluck, screw, the pluck strings, how that would sound. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I uh, you know, there's always moments where, you know, anything can work in the right way in a certain moment. You know, that's what's so amazing about about film scoring. I mean, it's amazing about any music. You can just like, if you can, there's always a situation where something's going to work. There's no rules, you know? And it's like, I, I like making rules for myself because it, 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 it's really hard to be creative when you just have the entire world in front of you and, and you have no borders. If someone, if there's a film score you're making and, and you know, you haven't figured out what your guidelines are, you haven't figured out what your rules are, you, you haven't figured out what instruments you're using, I mean, and you're just like, uh, make anything, it's kind of like, you don't know, what, it's very hard to figure out what to do. Right, right, right. Um, with Luca, when you came aboard uh, Pixar Disney and you first witnessed some of the storyboards and artwork for it, was your mind just completely blown? Like with some of the artwork and like, oh man, this looks like a great picture. And oh, all the inner workings and the gears started rolling your head. Like what kind of music can I make? Oh yeah, it was so exciting to see the initial stuff. And I mean, you know, I, I, I was in love with the story and... I was so excited to make that music. And, you know, I, uh, we kind of like, we, it, it was a little bit of a process figuring out exactly what kind of music we wanted to do for it. Cause it kind of, when we started out, we were talking a little bit more about some more experimental stuff. And then we kind of were like, no, this needs to be Italian sounding. And then I went on my like really Italian deep dive and like, like uh, yeah, and, and then, uh, I kind of got a little bit too Italian and Enrico was sort of like, it's sounding a little bit too like Italian film score-y. Like, I don't want specifically an Italian score. What I want is like a Dan Romer score that has Italian influence. And that's when we kind of went to that middle path. And it, and it showed off. I, I loved it. Like, even with like Buongiorno Massimo, like you have that Italian sound within the Dan Romer style. And it was- Oh, thank you. Worked, 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 worked great. Uh, Talk to me about Far Cry 5 and doing video game music as opposed to film score and, you know, all like the differences that goes in there and telling like a story musically. Yeah, I mean, well, Far Cry was like a really, really unique uh, project because they, the way that we engaged on that, they were, they said, here is a Bible that we wrote for this murderous cult that the game is about. Uh -huh. And they gave me a Bible. The Bible doesn't appear in the game. This is just an internal document we had. Okay. They gave me a copy of the Bible. It was like 20 pages or something. I read it through. And then they said, so now we want you to write 20, uh, sorry, we want you to write 10 folk hymns based on this Bible. And these hymns should be um, for, the, 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 the cult is going to use these in the game for uh, recruitment purposes for brainwashing purposes and for just like morale purposes. Um, you know, they're like, these don't want to be evil folk songs. These want to be folk songs that unite these people. And, uh, you know, so um, I wrote these 10 songs. Um, I can't actually remember if I, I started writing some of the score while writing the songs, but their basic concept was write these 10 songs and then let's have the entire score be based around uh, these 10 songs, melodically, harmonically. Let's borrow from these 10 songs the whole score. Um, and so it was a very unique project in that sense. I mean, you know, I could have scored a movie that way too, where if I was working on a movie about a murderous cult and I said, write these folk hymns and then write the entire score based on those hymns, it would have been a very similar experience. As far as like the technicality stuff with the video games go, I mean, there were, there was quite a bit of music that was meant to be loops, you know, they were they like, write these like three minute, two minute loops, whatever it was. Um, and that was like an interesting thing where it kind of writing like action loops or stealth or like stealth tension loops, it reminded me quite a bit of making pop music, you know, cause it was more like, it wasn't like along with moments. It was more like 
do whatever you want to do sort of like make the music you want to make just like keep the keep this emotion in mind so it's sort of like dance music where it's like you know you're not trying to hit specific moments you're just trying to make something that feels a certain way all the way through it has peaks and valleys ebbs and flows that's interesting that it uh went there uh what was one of your favorite tracks from far cry 5 that you remember doing well you know i mean i don't know if this is pandering but i i guess i would say um uh uh um uh 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 Jesus Christ! Why am I? Uh, this is so embarrassing. Me blanking on the, your, your 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 because not when the morning not when the because I was just talking to you about when the morning light, uh, light shines in. Uh, now that now that this old world is ending, thank you. Sorry. Uh, now that this old world is ending um, was uh, uh, the startup music in the game, I believe. Um, and uh, it's been a minute. I haven't played that game in years now uh, since it came out. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, the process of making that piece of music like was one of my favorite things where I didn't really write it in advance and then have musicians come in and play it. I just kind of like wrote a banjo line. I put a drone down and then wrote a banjo line and then had this slide player, slide guitar player come in and I was like, uh, just play this. Ba 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 he's like okay cool and like topping what i'm singing i was kind of making it up on the fly the melody of that piece and uh and then you know i just like kept doing more and more instruments on it and i remember as i was making it i was i was thinking to myself this is definitely one of my favorite pieces of music i've ever made in my life that's incredible that's incredible uh what about dear evan hansen coming off this uh big broadway play you got to be part of that what was that like bringing this your style to this uh this big production um you know i will say this is like that's a production where it's like um you know it's not often when you're uh when you're a composer that you are put like collaborating uh in that way with such heavy hitters you know it's like you know justin and benj and and lack like the three of them are just all so so talented and like you know lax lax string arranging is incredible uh this is alex lackmore the uh the uh he's the um music director on on dear van hansen he's also the music director on uh hamilton in the heights um he just scored uh um pivo um he works a little bit a lot. Um, he's like, you know, I, I remember, you know, there was, uh, you know, we, we split up certain duties of music producing, you know, we were a team and we covered a lot of the same bases and we also like divided up a lot of stuff. And like, I remember when we were recording the songs in, uh, we were recording this, the orchestra for the songs. Um, he wrote, he did more work on on so big so small um and uh 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 i did more work on a little closer as far as like what we contributed to the orchestra writing and like we were both they, we recorded those two they're two of the big ballads in, in the movie we we recorded them right back to back with each other and lack and i were both just like crying and hugging each other during these recordings it was just like overwhelmed by how great a musician he is and you know it was just it was it was such such a lovely experience, you know? That's awesome, that's awesome. And then of course, a typical, that great Netflix show with the great music. I love that you were part of that as well. Like I, I instantly can tell, like that's Dan Romer music right there. Oh, thank you. That was my like, that was my first TV show that was like um, done, you know, made the way a, a TV show is normally made. Because I, I, I say that because I did score a TV show before that called Easy which I, which I love with all my heart. Joe Swanberg's incredible. Um, but you know, that, that show was done in a way of like, that, that was, show was more like a series of short films, uh, like an anthology se series of short films. And I didn't score every episode of that show. I did about half the episodes e each season. Um, but Atypical was my first TV show where it was like, here's the show, you're scoring the whole season. 
And I had such a blast doing that show. And I'm sad it's over. Yeah, I'm sad it's over too. Uh, but yeah, it was a great, great, great music, great show. Um, I have a very important question for you, if you don't mind. Oh my God, please ask um, it. What, why is Lucy the dog the best dog in the world? <laughs> Wait, is it, are you on my Instagram? Did I say that? Yeah, I had a little deep dive there. <laughs> I mean, Lucy, so Lucy was our dog, Is well, so Lucy was our dog in our old studio. Um, Mike, one of my co-composers, um, he scores Love Life um, and Rami with me. Okay. Um, and, he, uh, he, and he did a lot of drum programming on Jeremy Hansen and, and like, you know, he's, he's one of my most frequent collaborators. Um, we were both working at that studio together and, um, and one of our neighbors, brought this little tiny chihuahua by and there and he was like hey i just found her at the gas station nearby you know do you we don't know what we, we're you know we were just wanted to see if you guys wanted a dog and uh mike's then girlfriend now wife angela uh fell madly in love with this dog immediately and the dog was so calm and so scared and so you know frail uh and then within a week of us having her in the studio, she became this ferocious warrior who just <laughs> screamed at every single person passing by. She was just like the devil. Um, and then she slowly calmed down. But the thing is, when you have a dog that's so angry, you know, she had, and she had a little BB lodged in her, in her leg. You know, she, she was definitely not, not treated so great in her previous life. And when you have a dog that's so ferocious and then slowly becomes sweet and loves you and, you know, and starts cuddling with you, it's like just this incredible feeling. And, and, and I just spent a lot of time with Lucy. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love her. She would have panic attacks sometimes. I, I, it seems like that's what was happening where she would just go to the couch in the lounge of the, uh, in the living room of our studio and just start just screaming, like sound, sounding like a human almost just like, ah! and then, <laughs> Everyone in the entire studio would just have to come running and put their hands on her to calm her down. Um, but yeah, I love that dog. She's she's uh, she's uh, living out in uh, Pasadena right now. All right, Lucy, well, cute dog. Check out the Instagram for those pictures. Um, so, how many instruments do you play right now? Um, you know, it's kind of hard to think about it in terms of like single instruments, I guess. But I mean. So I started on guitar and then I moved to piano when I was like 13. And then I started, you know, when I started playing with rock bands, started playing drums and bass. Um, and then when I got to college, I borrowed an accordion from the music, from the instrument borrowing room. Um, and I started playing that as like kind of what I would play with most when I was playing live. Well, I started playing in this band called The Woes, which my friend Ose, uh, was the the leader of and uh uh Ose and i have scored a few films together since but um i was in his band for a very very long time and i play accordion in his band but so yeah i mean the general thing is like i can play guitar instruments so that's like guitar banjo mandolin ukulele like kind of anything with frets you know that i can get my hands on uh i can well i should say before any of this stuff I can play all these instruments mediocrely. I'm not very good at any of these instruments. I, I only need, I only feel that the need uh, to get as good as an instrument, uh, as good on an, an instrument as I need to play something very simple, because I know ultimately if I need like a really, really great banjo player, um, there's no need for me to study for like 10 years to become this incredible banjo player, because there's not only so often I'll need in, incredible banjo playing. Right. But more often, I might just need like a banjo, like a single banjo note going dang a dang a dang a dang a dang a dang a you know, or just like some simple chords being played. I, mean, I you know, I played banjo on the uh, on the Far Cry Five like album, the songs, right? You know, um, so it's like I can play like that kind of stuff, but I can't do like really complicated things. Um, so yeah, I can play those instruments. I can play you know whatever keyboard instruments I, uh, that you put in front of me, anything with the, more or less anything with the keyboard uh you know percussion instruments that have keyboards like marimbas and vibes those kinds of things and you know i i can play a bunch of percussion stuff i'm not incredible on a drum kit uh but i haven't really used much drum kit in my life uh recently um and then um 
I've been venturing into playing some cello and viola. I'm not very good yet, but I, I can do horror score stuff. Awesome. Um, and then, and then I've been playing. This is I feel kind of stupid about this. I've been playing mini tuba for 20 years now, and I'm still wait. 20 years? Yeah, it's been like 20 years and I'm still <laughs> like really not good. That's cool. That's cool. Is there is there a piece in your collection that's the most unusual instrument? Yeah, I'd say it's this I'd say it's this mini tuba. Come on. I mean, I guess this is the most unusual thing. People don't really play it. This isn't is this an a visual podcast or just an audio? Yeah, it'll be visual and audio. Yes, visual. Yes. It's this guy. <laughs> See, I, you can tell how good I've gotten at it. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not, a, I'm not, I'm not doing, giving it its best light, but yeah. That's all you're getting. That's, that, that's, I haven't played in a while. No, no, no <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, I said, the, the embouchure needs to be worked out. But yeah, no, I like the, I, I, that thing is that awesome looking. And I, that is, again, that is something Tom Waits would have in his band. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> here, I'll give you a little bit of a more... Yeah, it's a cool instrument. So what happened was I fell in love with, um, I am usually better than that. I, 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 I usually am not embarrassed about how bad I am at instruments, but this is a moment where I have to say that, that I'm usually, I can play stuff on it. I played, I played a fair amount of Good Doctor. It became Glassman's uh, kind of uh, pad instrument. The instrument you'd hear during his dreams, you would hear these uh, mini tuba pads. Oh, that's cool. Um, but, um, yeah, what happened was when I was 23, no, so I've only been playing for 15 years because when I was 23 years old, I fell madly in love with this band called Slavic Soul Party. Okay. And um, they play, uh, a lot of them play horns on uh, Superman, the Superman score I'm doing right now. Um, and the, and the, 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 one of the trumpet players in that band played the trumpet lines on Beast of the Player Wild. Um, so I went to go see them play when I was 23 and I fell so in love with them. They're um they're like they're like a nine-piece brass marching band they play in brooklyn every tuesday at barbez at nine o'clock um and uh it's like eastern european music but sort of with like a more american slash new orleans feeling uh percussion groove aggression thing going on okay so they're just i've seen them probably 150 200 times live um and <laughs> so you know, I, I was going to see them every Tuesday, and then I was talking to uh, a guy who would hang out at those shows. Um, his name is Quince, and um, he was also a horn player. And I was talking to Quince, and I was like, I really want to learn how to play a brass instrument. I was thinking about learning how to play trumpet. And he said, how old are you? And I said, 23. And he said, um, well, you're way too old to start playing trumpet because everyone's just going to run circles around you. Um, so what you should do is, um, buy a peck horn, a mini tuba, and then it's also called a peck horn. And go buy a peck horn, and then you can get like mediocre, and then everyone will want to play with you. Want will want you to play with them. And so you know, um, I never got even me mediocre at it, but um, I did play it on tour with Inger Michaelson a bit. Well, that's all, that's awesome. I feel like you got way better than mediocre. You got pretty good. It's it's on it's on TV. That's excellent. It's on TV. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so being part of all these bands, uh, what's the strangest venue you've ever played at? Uh, hmm, that's a good question. Um, oh, well, okay. I guess, no, it's actually easy. Um, I played at, um, uh, there's this mansion in, in, LA called the Paramore. Okay. Uh, that's actually not far from, uh, from where I live um, in Silver Lake. But uh, it's so this group of composers called the Echo Society um, that um, Joe Trapanese is a part of Rob Simonson. Oh, it's, I know yeah, Joe. Uh, yeah. You know Joe? Cool. I know Love Joe. Um, so they asked me to do one of their concert series with them. And so what they were doing was they put a different composer in a bunch of different rooms in this mansion and the idea is that everyone has a 10 minute piece of music that they're looping or like improvising for an hour and a half it doesn't matter like the, the idea is a new piece of music that was that 
someone could spend 10 minutes in and then leave. Um, and this is actually an incredible way to listen to experimental music because like when you go to like an experimental music concert of some kind and you hate, there's a good chance you're going to hate the piece of music that, the, that is being played. Like if it's just someone who's like, I mean, everyone has their own nightmare of what an experimental thing could be, you know, and it's like, if your if your nightmare is just someone sitting there with a guitar, you know, and an amp, just making feedback for an hour, like you're you're shit out of luck if you are, get to that show and then there's just a guy playing it for an hour and a half, whatever, you know, it's like oh, I guess I got to sit here through all this. But if in every different room in a house there is a different thing happening, then you don't like the thing you're at, you can leave, you go to another one, you know, and so that's what the setup was that's badass <laughs> it was cool yeah so like you know at risk of being name droppy or whatever i mean whatever it's, 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 I, so i like i was in one room reggie watts was right up the stairs for me doing a thing in, in a room up there awesome the singer from grizzly bear was in the room on the other side of me um it was cool and so i was i was actually singing songs uh i was playing baritone ukulele and accordion and i had a little string trio playing with me that is super cool but um, I had, a, there was a bunch of taxidermy animals around me there. There was, I think, like a polar bear and a, <laughs> a there's a bear and a, maybe a moose. I can't remember exactly. Oh, my. Well, I mean, that you just kind of described like a musical version of Eyes Wide Shut. You just need the masks. <laughs> it was Eyes Wide Shut vibes for sure. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Um, so are there any music moments in film like certain music moments like scenes from movies that have always stuck with you uh you know growing up that you still think to today yeah i mean i'd say Ed edward scissorhands ice dance that you know that is one of the most transcendental musical moments uh i mean forget film in film or in music i mean it's just like that that moment is just unreal you know it's it's so beautiful um and I would say the first uh, 10 minutes of There Will Be Blood, um, that is, or whatever it is, 10, 15, I can't remember exactly, all those strings going up and down, uh, that's just such an incredible moment. Um, that's not from childhood, but, uh, you know. Um, I don't think there's any other childhood ones that have kind of stuck with me. Because that, that's kind of an interesting thing. It's like, because, you know, I wasn't even intending on being a film composer until, you know, the end of my 20s. So you know, it wasn't something that, it's not like I grew up, you know, I know there's a lot of film composers out there and a lot of people working in film composing who were, who were like, oh, you like knew every John Williams piece by heart by the time I was like 11. And that wasn't me, you know? Um, but I mean, I guess um, the last music, uh, the last 10 minutes of Harold and Maude. Ooh, uh, yes. is a big one for me. Uh, Cat Stevens singing Trouble. That's like, whew, I mean, that, that will make you cry, Jesus. Um, I, <laughs> this isn't music and this isn't film, but I will say I, what I found out about myself is that I can't make it through watching the video for Kate Bush, this woman's work without hysterically crying. Like I can't, I have, I cry watching that music video no matter what. That's awesome. It's no, really I know, I know exactly. Song. No, it is that 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 is a very an emotional song. I feel the same way about "Breathe Me, Sia," <laughs> which is awesome. I'm overstating when I say hysterically. I have hysterically cried to that video, but I can't make it through without at least a little bit of tear coming out of my eye. No, that's good. That's good. Um, is there? Well, so tell me, what is the most thrilling musical experience for you, both as a performer and then as a fan? Like, would it be like, like whether you sat front row at a concert or like when you played at this certain venue or whatever, most thrilling music experience for you? Huh. Um, as far as playing, yeah, like, I think that that, Par that Paramore show, that show at the Paramore might have been one of the most musically fulfilling things. I mean, I was I couldn't stop crying while I was doing that whole show. I, I you're you know you're noticing a theme here about me crying. I cry a lot. Um, I'm a crier. Uh, but um, I mean, there's yeah there's there is something about the musical experience of like 
when you're when you've written a film score and there's an orchestra uh you know in the in the room and you go from the recording booth and go sit on the floor while they play mm -hmm. that's like otherworldly you know um and on luca i remember i did that for go find out go find out for me um the final the final cue I wanted mm -hmm. to listen to the orchestra play it, and I, I was, I was in tears. I was so happy. Um, as far as like as a fan, I mean, still like, for me, if there's a packed room at a Slavic Soul Party show, that's just like it for me. And I mean that the room that they play in can maybe fit sixty people, seventy people max. Like it's a small room in the back of a bar. Um, so intimate, intimate. You, yeah, if you go there on a night where like the weather is right and people are like, let's go out. Like if it's like in New York, if it's been like, let's say it's been cold for like three weeks in a row and then there's like a warm night, um, then you go to see Slavic Soul Party. It's just wild in there. It's amazing. All right. All right. That's cool. Uh, what's the most curious uh, slash weirdest a uh, recording you own, whether it be like a song on an LP or a CD or just something you recorded? Mm -hmm. What's the strangest or most curious recording you own? Well, I don't, you know, I wouldn't call it the strangest, but I, I think the thing that I would talk about with that is that I, I, um, I bought a, um, an album off of Amazon like 10 years ago, um, which is all um, uh, pygmy music. Uh, I think that the record is called something like Vo "Voices of the of the of the Forests" or something. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's like it's like field recordings uh, uh, of of of, of uh, the pygmies um, doing this beautiful polyphonic, doing this beautiful like, choral music that like really resembles um, really resembles modern pop music to me in in ways that other things you hear don't. And I put it, I like ripped it and I put it in my Dropbox and it just sits there. And every so often I like, uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I mention it and then I, I, I text someone the Dropbox link so other people can have it, but it's not on Spotify. Maybe it is now. I mean, I haven't checked in a while, but before it was like, it just didn't exist anywhere, but as a $50 CD on Amazon, like it costs 50 bucks to buy the CD. But it I wasn't look, a double album, it was one CD. I'm going to look this up. I'm going to add it to this show. <laughs> You know, I I want to. I'm not sure if I had that. That you know what? I was actually looking through some boxes, and I had. Wait, hold on. Pygmy music. Give me one second. I know this is thrilling podcast uh, 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 material. Me looking <laughs> at my phone, uh, but I really want to. Uh, 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 I really want to get this right for you. Um, oh yeah, I think it's just called Voices of the Forest, recording of the. Is this it? Nah, it might be a different thing. Either, all right, I'll, I'll find it for you and I'll get it over to you. Okay, cool, but, cool, um, cool. Yeah, I, I love that thing. And, you know, um, just as I go in general, you know, it becomes really more interesting to listen to, you know, because I feel like we're exposed to so much uh, pop music our whole lives. And when I say pop music, I, I am talking about like Bruno Mars and Katy Perry and Ariana Grande and Doja Cat. I am, I am talking about those people but i'm also talking i'm also talking about tom waits i'm talking about frank sinatra i'm talking about the beatles i'm talking about harry belafonte um you know this is all pop music it's all music that you know you put it's like out it's people record it they write it for an album they put it on an album you know um but like it's really lovely to go listen to the traditional musics of different cultures because those are songs that have stuck around for untold amounts of years you know and it's like, who knows how long certain pop songs will be around. They might be forgotten imminently. Certainly most of them will be forgotten in a hundred years that, 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 that we know right now. Right. Um, but, um, you know, some of these songs uh, have just been around for a thousand, thousand plus years, you know, and there's a reason why they stick around so long. Yep. Uh, they're, there's something about them that, I mean, people will draw off of those songs and bring them to their own style and yeah i like that stuff yeah absolutely right. um so if you had to curate curate a uh a three 
a track list of Tom Waits songs, what that what would they be? Oh my God, Jesus! <laughs> oh no, this is terrifying. I mean, oh. like, ah oh, man, I would almost just say like, oh, but what's the purpose of this? Three, three, three song playlist. Um, you, you got, so you, you met somebody who loves music, but has never heard Tom Waits and you're like, okay, this is the track list, the three to start you off to become the biggest fan of Tom Waits. Okay. I guess, <laughs> I guess, and they've never heard Tom Waits before. Never heard Tom Waits before. Okay. I would say. Oof. well the earth when the earth died screaming okay wonderful and an know, excellent title too <laughs> now i know and i i know that song is like you know it, it's not very accessible but it's sort of like a i've played that song for people who don't know tom wake and they're like what is this it's just unlike anything they've ever heard before you know and I, I actually did a, a, a I, I did a Tom Waits cover show, I, I, I where I um, God I wish I could do it for you right now, um, but I don't have to have the things. So what I did was I propped a ukulele up on my wrist uh -huh. and tuned it to an A minor, just tuned it to a minor chord, and then and then had a kick drum at my foot, and then on my left hand I played the bass on a piano, and I just was like doing this like dong 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 dong. So I strumming the ukulele <laughs> and playing the bass on the piano and hitting the kick drum at the same time. And I did when the Earth died screaming uh, with that. That's such like I that, that's such an important song to me. Um, but so uh, oh, it's so hard. This is so hard. I mean, <laughs> I would say that. I would say. I mean, Tangle till they're sore. I would say that song. Like, um, uh, yeah. I I mean, it's. I would just say to someone if you want to get into Tom Waits listen to the first, like, just like, listen to Rain Dogs. Like, Rain Dogs, yeah. You know, the, like, the first, it, the, it does get a little bit, like, I don't want to say lost, but, like, the first 10 songs of Rain Dogs, I would never say lost. That whole, whole album's incredible. The first 10 songs of Rain Dogs as a, as a group, you're just, like, nonstop, like, hit after hit after hit after hit. Right, right. You know? Oh, so good, so good. I love, because... <laughs> when people have asked me like, what's Tom Waits? And I, and I always go to the, like one song. And I was like, this song is all about food. And it's called Filipino box spring hog. And yeah, it's just, nice, nice. and it's just kind of like this weird, funky, almost pop Tom Waits song. Cause he doesn't have many of those, but it is, it cracks me up. I love that song so much. It's a good Yeah. One. I mean, a lot of the time, like what will happen is, you know, you, you show people Tom Waits when they don't know him. And then, and then you're like, Oh, you might know this song. You play them Downtown Train. Mm -hmm. And they're like, wait, do I think I might? And they're like, yeah, Rod Stewart sings this song. This is a big Rod Stewart song. And they're like, oh my God, that's crazy. And you play them the Rod Stewart version. And then and like, that's a little bit of like an insight of like, oh my God, Tom Waits is this like songwriting genius. He just has this like, like way he makes music that, you know, doesn't sound that poppy. But then like when you become a Tom Waits fan, you're just like, I would not want him to sound any other way possibly in the universe. Right, right, right. Oh, well, this was such a fun conversation. I got to save more for the next time we have a show together. It'd be so great. Um, the spotlight's I on you, that. Dan. Uh, tell everybody where they can find you and listen to you. Uh, you can search me uh, on Spotify. I'm Dan Romer on Spotify. Uh, on Instagram, I am Dan Romer. On Twitter, I am Dan underscore Romer. Uh, and I think that'll, that pretty much does it. There you go. And check out Luca, buy the soundtrack, buy the movie, listen to that music.